Hello and good evening and welcome to a special program on NewsX powered by One Expat. In the ODI World Cup 20, 2023 match between Netherlands and England at Pune's MCA Stadium, England won the toss and chose to bat, which is alright. Moin Ali with four runs was caught by Aryandat of Bastelid. Joss Butler with five runs was caught by Paul Owen McKeeran. Of Teja, Teja, yes. Uh, Harry Brook was 11 and was out on Basley Leeds, another delivery. David Milan scored an impressive 87 runs. Joe Root, 28 runs, was bowled by Logan Van Beek. England's first wicket fell in the seventh over when Johnny Bairstow was caught by Aryan Dutt of Paul Van. Well, Milan missed a century and was run out by the wicketkeeper Scott Edwards of Logan. A partnership of 85 runs between Milan and Root was crucial. England scored 70 runs in the power play, but the progress was slowed after losing Johnny Besto early. Root and Milan then steadied the innings, but most importantly, our job is to get the update with Tasmin Granger, who is international one-day player and international player for Zimbabwe for the past decade and a half. She joins me along with another uh, Zimbabwean very, very senior journalist, uh, a person that we know, Larry. Larry, welcome to the show. But first, I will go to Tasmin. I would go on to Tasmin Brendan and also welcome David Brooks, who I can see is sitting in the car. All right. Tasmin, what's the latest update that we have right now? Good evening to you all. So currently Australia just crossed the 300 mark, I mean England, sorry, yes. just crossed the 300 mark not too long ago. They're currently sitting on 311 for the loss of six. And that's coming in the 48.1 overs. So they still got 1.5 overs to go. And their acceleration rate for me has just been brilliant. You know, they lost 50 between the period of 250 to 300 runs coming in just 17 balls. So they've definitely just put their foot on the gas and they're going for it right now. Well, wonderful. They're putting the foot on the gas. Well, uh, I would come to David, but first, uh, let me welcome Larry. Larry, it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Welcome to the show. How, how do you think, standing from there, from Zimbabwe, how is the world looking to you, especially the World Cup? And do you find lonely yourself not being able to compete because you guys just missed by a whisker? Well, it was, it was a terrible experience. And thank you very much for having me on the show. It was a terrible experience not to be there because, you know, the World Cup is a, is, is a global tournament and we hosted the qualifier. And I'll tell you, it's also very exciting to see the story that is the Netherlands as well as Afghanistan because Afghanistan have played with them quite a bit. But uh, the Netherlands, the fact that they've been able to get wins there in a, within a whisker of qualifying for the a Champions Trophy. But I think... John, um, what's his name? Um, ben Stokes getting a century today, putting his marker on there is going to make it a little bit more difficult. But they've got a lot more stories to tell than the Netherlands are. Well, absolutely. A lot more story. But just take a step back. You've recently got a T20 new skipper. Uh, it's a different thing altogether. But you want to just highlight 30 seconds more on your, on, on your new skipper and why and the reasoning behind it? I think the reason <clears throat> that the new skipper, first of all, Craig Irvin has done a great job to get us this far, but I think his numbers have not been looking great. So I think the the selectors might be wanting to look, give themselves an option to drop him if they need to when you when you have you know different conditions. And he didn't do very well in Namibia, so I think that also accelerated the decision. Sikandar Raza has done the job before and is a guy who's respected in the in the in the dressing room. And I think that's the reason they've gone with him because the, in as far as seniority, that's where they were going to go. Well, absolutely. It's about seniority. It's about the guts and everything. Welcome, David, on the show. David, what do we have here? Are you smiling? Are you happy? S seeing finally in England scoring the 300 runs mark. Forget the opposition, but you still have time for celebration. Is it? David, I can't hear you. David, you'll have to unmute yourself before you get on to the show. I'm unmuted. Okay. All right. Go on. Well, forgive me if I don't unpop the champagne corks quite yet. Um, this is a battle for the wooden spoon, after all. Let's not forget that. But yes, I've enjoyed watching Ben Stokes bat. Who wouldn't watch, enjoy watching Ben Stokes bat? And it's just a reminder of the struggles that some of the other players have been through. I mean, Joss Butler 
His head is more scrambled than the eggs I made for breakfast this morning. Where's his next run going to come from? And Joe Root's dismissal will be played over and over again in England. A scoop shot bowled through his legs. Joe Root, surely some mistake. Well, Joe Root made, did make some ground earlier um, in, the, in the tournament with those scoop shots. But suddenly things didn't go his way. I mean, are we being too harsh on him? Uh, well, I don't think we are. As a senior player, he's one of the people who have underperformed and can expect to be playing his last couple of one-day internationals. I've no doubt at all that there will be casualties. The question is when, you know, in time for that series in the Caribbean, England goes straight off to play a white ball series in the Caribbean. And mm -hmm. I just, I can't see Joss Butler and Matthew Mott remaining intact. They just look, I mean, Matthew Mott, when he saw him in the dugout, it looked like he'd seen a ghost. And maybe he has. Maybe he's seen his own ghost of his cricketing contract with England and Wales. Is it too early board. to write his obituary considering he's got considerable success? And Tasmin, just walk in here, look at the camera <clears throat> and, and address the fans. Yes, that's a better sight. Just tell us what the latest update is. Yeah, so um, I was just uh, bugging you guys, trying to get your attention. Uh, England has just lost another wicket in Chris Wilkes. Prior to that, um, he came out um, bold as well by Pastor Lead. You know, he was caught at the back behind by Ch by Edwards. And he, he's, he's been playing a mammoth of an innings. He scored 51, just off 45, um, as well as Ben Stokes has crossed the 100 mark as well. That coming off just 78 deliveries. And he's still at the crease right now. But Netherlands may be a bit too late, just taking another wicket as well. He, they've just got Wiley out as well, and this does fall to best lead as well in the closing overs here. Best lead on three wickets now, right now. Well, absolutely, best lead with three wickets right now. You know, the other day, uh, David, do you remember the 2007 World Cup where best lead's father played an incredible innings for uh, Netherlands? And I happened to ask him on the very fateful day when Australia nearly murdered. He says, you know, these things happen in sport, but even at his worst, even at this age, his father is still better and he wouldn't have conceded as many runs to Maxwell. But that was a different story altogether. But what do you make of it? You're very bitter as an English fan. I mean, Bami Army has already left the ground. They're not here anymore. Uh, th there have been obituaries that have been written in various newspapers. What makes you so bitter? And not hopeful at all of the of uh, the English side. Well, I'm not bitter. Uh, I'm just, it's more in sorrow than in anger. Uh, one obviously likes to see the team where one is domiciled doing well. But I have to say, I couldn't help suppress a smile actually at some of the dismissals that we saw early on, because it's all too easy for the England authorities to say, "What's the problem? We scored 400 against right. Netherlands." I mean, it really isn't. It really, this is really after the Lord Mayor's show, as they say. I mean, it's an inconsequential uh, match for England. Uh, they're fighting for European ascendancy. And, uh, well, I mean, we, we, the United Kingdom left Europe, European Union, and now we could be exiting the European cricket arena as well. Well, Larry... What do you make of the of the entire game today? Are there are there any big uh, big hitters, good, exciting players that you've seen from the Netherlands cricket right now? Well, I mean, look, the Netherlands are capable of chasing this down because uh, at the qualifier against the West Indies, they chased down three hundred and seventy five. Well, they got to 374 and went to a super over. They are very, very capable. And if you, if you saw earlier, their Scott Edwards, their captain, played a very wonderful innings the, a couple of days ago and actually won a match. So the Netherlands are in this by every, every stretch of the imagination. We're not looking at the best England bowling uh, setup that we've seen in, in a while. And also, I, I, I feel sorry for David Brooks mentioned it a couple of times. It's looking a bit silly. And it's because I think they don't know how to play um, 50 over cricket anymore. They, they think everything is basketball. England did not prepare for the conditions to play 
uh, World Cup cricket and uh, 50 over cricket in this particular tournament. And you look at teams like um, the Netherlands and you look at, of course, the hosts, they are treating this tournament uh, on the basis of the pitch on that day and what they need to achieve. Very important point you raised that it is the baseball effect. But uh, Larry, we've got to put records straight and uh, David has been talking and professing his dismay for the last three months, saying that English team is not prepared. I think it's time for him to recap that conversation and tell us what was wrong in the preparation so we know exactly. Because, uh, But the good part here is this is the highest power play, the first power play score England has made, uh, 70 runs with one wicket, which is better, a shade better than South Africa at 67. Otherwise, the, the scorecard looks abysmally sorrow. David, what went wrong prior to the World Cup? Uh, how was the preparation bad, according to you? Well, thank you for those problems of comfort, uh, Sunil, about the power play. But yeah, England's problem started um, a long while ago with uh, an arrogant... I mean, Roland Butcher on your breakfast show this morning yes. described the England attitude as arrogant and showing contempt for 50 over cricket. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, none of these England, none of the players playing today played in the domestic 50 over tournament. Oh no, they had bigger fish to fry. Which they is? were playing in a 100 ball tournament and created by the English Cricket Board as a rival to the IPL. I mean, have you ever heard anything so ridiculous? How can you launch a rival to the IPL? Uh, they should be looking for closer links with India, not trying to remove themselves from the fray with a new format that kind of reinvented the rules of cricket with five ball overs and we're not even allowed to call them overs. They said it wasn't aimed at cricket fans. Well, who is it aimed at then? Imagine a soccer guy organising a competition that wasn't aimed at soccer fans. I mean, it is ridiculous. And we've also seen in the preparation playing a meaningless T20 series against New Zealand and then just four ODIs against Ireland where they fielded a second string team. I mean, it's poor. And go, and above that, I mean, can I just... Larry's made a good point about Basball. But Basball was created by the leadership team of Baz McCullum and Ben Stokes. Neither of them are in the dugout as captain or coach. It's that we've, They've passed it over to uh, Matthew Mott and Joss Butler, and they've misinterpreted it. For a start, Basball was a, a response to test cricket, to enliven test cricket, to play it in a more attacking way. Did well with it much better than under Joe Root's captaincy, which preceded it. England were in the doldrums under Joe Root. Uh, but there's been no sadder sight than seeing Joe Root on the cricket field over the last few weeks. Well, one sadder sight would be to see him in a press conference where he really doesn't have anything to say. Joss Butler doesn't have anything to say. And when we talk about leadership, we've seen examples in this World Cup of teams that are playing as a team under a very good leader and coach. I pick out South Africa as an example of that. They've got their house in order. They've played beautifully. Afghanistan under Jonathan Trott. I'd like to claim him as an Englishman, but we all know he learned his cricket in South Africa as well. So it's a great tournament for Southern Africa. I'm disappointed that Zimbabwe aren't there. I'm disappointed that West Indies aren't there. And But it's very, um, despite that, seeing England at the bottom of the table, playing the Netherlands for the wooden spoon, I mean, it's really not what it's predicted, but I did predict it. I said it to you before the start of the tournament. I said England will be the first ones to drop out. Ev Michael Vaughan on the BBC was saying, no pundit England wouldn't reach the semi-final. Well, I did, and Roland Butcher was also with me on that occasion. The contempt with which England has treated the 50-over competition is astonishing. And, and borne out by the MCC new president, Mark Nicholas, who has called for an end to bilateral ODIs, except during World Cup years. They're drowning in an orgy of T20 short-form cricket, and they've played this 50-over tournament like a T20, and they haven't, I agree with Larry, they haven't played the conditions. It's one thing for Bairstow to score centuries on a flat track at Trent Bridge in summer. It's another thing to play in these conditions. You need a defence, and you need a plan B. And we haven't seen that from the England team. And the contempt they're showing for long-form cricket, if I may say, 50 over. They won't. Joss Butler hasn't played a first-class match since he was dropped from the Test match team. His head is frazzled 
from all the con uh, from all the franchises he's playing for. Don't forget, they are domestic franchises. They're not international tournaments. And when you come up against international bowlers, there is no weak link to exploit. So international cricket has come to the fore, and the players that have starred in this tournament, the Virat Kohlis, uh, the Dow Mitchells, um, the 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 um, uh, Mark, the Aidan Markrams, or whatever, uh, Brenton de Kock, are players who are used to playing long form cricket. And, and well, uh, England have paid a heavy price here. Well, we've got an update and Tasmeen is going to give, the, give us that update. But before that, let me bring a smile on to you, David. Ben Stokes, first ODI World Cup 2023 century. Fifth century in the ODI career. But I'm sure that's a consolation. But we'll move on to Tasmeen. Tasmeen, what it's do no we consolation. have? It's no consolation because he shouldn't be here. <laughs> he, should be, he should be getting his knee fixed in time for the test series against India in the new year. Shouldn't be here. Tasmin, we'll move on to you. Tasmin, what is the latest update? So, uh, just within the lot at 50 overs, England have managed to score 339 runs for the loss of nine. Um, ben Stokes coming out in that last over. But I'm going to highlight for you again, we've had a, a running discussion about the power play, the third power play, and how much teams have begun to amass in the stage. And England just coming away with 124 runs from those last 10 overs as well, despite the fact that they were going a lot more slower during the middle period overs of the game. <coughs> well, one important factor here, just take us through the entire, how things spanned and Ben Stokes' uh, century here, so that it's easier for our fans to understand. And then we look at the weather and then move on to Larry with some, how will Netherlands play? Yeah, three points. Go on, Tasmin. Yeah, David. So uh, they they started they started quite decently, I'd say, in their first power play. They amassed 70 runs just for the loss of one wicket. Going on, they were just scoring 50s, you know, in decent succession for me. They were going at just under six runs and over everywhere until they picked up the pace somewhere around about the 250 mark. Between 200 and 250, they brought up their next 50, being 250 in 45 balls. Then the 300 being the big one that came up in 17 balls. Definitely well played by Ben Stokes. You know, he came in at a place where they probably Netherlands credited to some good building from them, getting rid of Dawid Milan because he was actually being pretty destructive for them. He had a big partnership of 85 runs alongside Joe Root at that stage. And it looked like England was finding their feet just before they managed to get him run out. Again, Chris Wolves and Ben Stokes as well coming in at the end, towards the end and rebuilding again. You know, the, the English scorecard doesn't say much justice for them. You've just got... Dawid Milan with 87, Ben before, Stokes finishing off on 108. Before, uh, Tasmin, before we move on to Larry, a quick another consolation to uh, David Brooks. Highest partnerships for the seventh or lower wicket in the World Cup history. Number one is Cummins and Maxwell, what we saw. Number two is 130, Egelbrack and Van Beek. Uh, Netherlands versus Sri Lanka, 130. And guess who is at number 129? It's Strokes and Vokes. David, are you happy with that record? We're going to be talking about the Mac. We're going to be talking about the Maxwell Cummins partnership long after people have forgotten about this inconsequential consolation prize for England. But I'm going to remember the Maxwell innings yesterday as one of the highlights of a really great tournament. Well, that was just a question to understand your angst and the depth of it. But we move on to <laughs> our friend Larry from Zimbabwe. Larry, if you're hearing us now, it's a huge to total. And Netherlands really need to play out of their skin to play this uh, and, and win this. Because remember, they're not playing for any pride. They're playing for top eight scene and to be, to be a part of the Champions Trophy and seek a larger purse if they go on to the next and also play on for more international series. Your views, Larry? That it might be a difficult score. The, the, what, what we've seen from the Indian pitches is it's very, very difficult to chase on those pitches. As much as I think the Netherlands uh, can chase down the score, I expect England to pick, the, pick this on us, particularly if David Willey, on his way out of uh, international cricket, Chris Wokes, as well as the spin of Moen Ali and Adil Rashid uh, come to the party, then that would be the case. But then that's where the problem is. That you need guys who know how to bowl 10 overs, not the four overs yeah. or over bursts. And that's where England has suffered a bit. Absolutely. That some of the guys start off great two over burst. Then after that, they don't know what they're bowling. But yeah. I am <laughs> going to look at, at uh, 
that's a win for, 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 for England. Having said that, I think the Netherlands' performance has been a great advertisement for the World Cup in 2027, where we'll have more associate nations. I think it's been, a, it's been sad that we didn't have a, a lot of associate nations playing the, the last couple of World Cups. And I think it just makes for a richer tournament and they get better and they also show that they're getting better at the game. Absolutely. But one thing, I was there at the, at the World Cup qualifiers and one little thing that came on is that the, the, the hunger to play at the international level was all time high. Larry, did you also see that while they were chasing, while they were, uh, Scotland for instance, really knocked off, uh, I mean Zimbabwe at that particular match, but I know it's a, it's a very painful memory to re revisit, <laughs> but I've got to do I that. Don't know. It's putting me into David Brooks' territory where I'm going to throw my, my toys out with the pram and, you know, hopefully the baby's not in there. So what I want to say is I think that uh, as, uh, as the associate nations, they've shown that they've gone a lot further than they were. Just I, I think this type, the of, question, type of matches... Larry, forgive me for interrupting. Let me ask you the pointed question. Are they playing for hunger, for, for pride, passion or, or purse? Because all three things are interacted, interconnected and you happen to represent a country that uh, is on the fringe of being an international as well as associate members. Tell us, what are they playing I for? Think, I, th I think uh, if we're talking about Netherlands, they're playing a lot for passion. But with enough passion, you're going to make money. So I think a lot more is in their passion and the national pride. That's what they, they're playing a lot more for. And having seen the way they, they sang their songs, the way they integrated with the locals, I think they, they, they were able to really come together for a carnival atmosphere. But ultimately, if you do well, then you get picked up by the counties, you get picked up by the leagues and whatever the case may be. But you have to do well at international cricket. Do you think it would have added a great deal of fan uh, fiesta if Castle Corner was singing the songs here in the Indian one Kedia or the Arun Jaitley Stadium? I think would have had the whole of India singing Castle Corner songs. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's all we had time for. We had Larry who joined us from Zimbabwe and uh, David Brooks, a man from London and Tasmin Granger who's, who's just nursing her, her uh, polluted throat and taking care of herself. Well, that's all we had time for. Keep watching NewsX. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.